SESI, uma iniciativa da CNI, Confederação Nacional da Indústria, apresenta... Education in Canada is run by each province separately. They have the autonomy. So there are 10 provinces and three territories. So at the federal level, there is no Department of Education. The uh, international assessments that are done by OECD in Paris have shown over the, the last uh, 10 years that Canada is one of the countries in that has high quality and high equity. That is the gap between high and low performance, for example, compared to US or England or many others. And they're in the top five for most of measures of literacy and, and high school graduation, for example. It's very high ranking. We don't think that measure is the main point. It's good to have it, but our measure is how do we keep going? And, and this is why uh, some of the newer ways of learning are a very strong interest because although we've done well traditionally, we now have to do well with innovation. And there are a lot of different ways to learn and adapt to different situations. Like there are a lot more uh, new opportunities. The things I've liked most about Glashen are all the extracurricular activities. Uh, there are so many opportunities to do sports and bands and clubs. Like there are so many, I can't even count them. Now, my other school, we didn't really have that many sports opportunities for girls. And here, I think it's extra. Like, they care um, so much more about uh, girls' sports and women's sports. And I think that that's really special. I think we're really lucky as a school because I know most don't have luxuries of lots of Chromebooks or use of cell phone in the class even. There's lots of learning tools around us we can use and the environment is good because our teachers sometimes give us period just to learn and study for tests or upcoming projects. So I really like the school. I like everything around us. It has a lot of international opportunities. It can not only improve my academic success, but everyone around me. The first day I came here, everyone included me. And um, from the first week, I knew exactly that this was going to be an awesome experience. God for thee. 
Well, Glashan is a school that some of my colleagues and I who were developing innovation identified about four years ago. Is it possible for a student to get good grades all the way through in high school and graduate with good grades and still not be good at life? So think about that. And the answer is usually people say, yeah, that's right. You can have, we know lots of people who were successful at school, but they're not successful at life. And the reason then there's two things that come from that. One is the realization that regular schooling, if you don't innovate, is boring. As you go up the classes, it gets more and more boring because it, it's less relevant to the day-to-day -day life. You really get this uh, constant stimulation of the outside world, and then you get this inner world of the schooling, which is not very interesting. So that boredom, let's call it, or alienation. If you want to do something about that, you start to uh, innovate. And this is, Glashen is a perfect example of a school that joined us because they wanted to do something different to make it more interesting for the students. Glashen Public School is one of Ottawa's oldest schools. It dates back 125 years, first opened in 1892, shortly after the first Canadian Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald. So the history of the school goes back a long, long ways. The, the original building uh, was demolished in 1979, essentially because uh, it was no longer viable as a, as a safe school. And uh, the new building, which we're in now, was constructed in 1979. The location in Centertown uh, makes Galashen's location very unique. Uh, we are close to Parliament Hill. We're just a few minutes away from the downtown area. Since 1892, Glashen has been serving this community incredibly well. It's got a long history in athletics. It's got a long history in serving new Canadians. And right now, here in 2018, we're looking to the future and how can we continue to serve students for another generation, just continuing to provide the great level of education that we have here at Glashen. So as an intermediate school with just two grade levels, grades seven and eight, currently with uh, just over 400 students, uh, we have a staff of approximately uh, 25 teachers, and then we have uh, additional staff in the form of educational assistants. The teacher assignments will also vary. We have uh, people on staff who uh, teach mathematics, and that's the, the core part of their assignment. We have others that will teach uh, English to French immersion. We're really proud of the music program that we offer here at the school. We've got an excellent drama and uh, arts program. In elementary schools, uh, teachers do teach generally more than one subject. And at Glashen, we certainly have a number of teachers who do teach multiple subjects. One of the approaches that we've taken for a number of years is an interdisciplinary approach where we integrate the history geography curriculum with the language arts curriculum. And uh, we call that integrated studies. So it's a combination of those particular disciplines. And we've got great success with that. from hobby to hobby, so I've done things like I've played a bunch of instruments. I play clarinet here at the school. I've done extracurricular activities like skating and pottery. Also, the school has a very wide range, like as well, I think the school puts an importance on athletics and arts, just like it does on academics. So if students are more creative, they could express that just as they could express it if they were more academically gifted. Nous sommes une école bilingue. Nos deux langues officielles de, du Canada, c'est l'anglais et le français. Alors ici, moi, j'enseigne en huitième année les classes d'immersion précoce et moyenne. Ce qui veut dire que mes élèves d'immersion précoce commencent le, leur cours en français entre la maternelle et la première année. Euh, et aussi, on a les, les élèves qui viennent du cycle de l'immersion moyenne. Alors, eux, ils commencent leur immersion en quatrième année, alors à l'âge de 9 ans. 
Alors comme ça, eux, ils arrivent chez nous à Glashen et rendu en huitième année, ça fait entre 4 et 5 ans de, de français intense pour eux. Alors ici, qu'est-ce que c'est une carte heuristique? Quelqu'un pourrait lire ça à une voix pour nous? Vas-y, Justice. Une carte heuristique est un schéma qui permet de représenter de façon visuelle des idées. Superbe. Alors, c'est représenter vos idées visuellement. Alors, c'est pas simplement un mot, mais en utilisant de différentes façons pour qu'on puisse voir vos pensées. Alors, pour développer vraiment un genre de, de relation avec les enfants, les élèves, c'est super important qu'on on comprend nos apprenants, on comprend non seulement leurs besoins académiques, mais au niveau social, au, au niveau émotionnel. Alors, le plus qu'on est capable de, de développer des, euh, des liens entre les enfants, leurs euh, leur souhaits, leurs activités parascolaires, leurs intérêts, c'est extrêmement important, surtout dans, les, dans le cadre d'immersion. Alors, afin de trouver des, euh, leurs excites qui, euh, qui gardent leur intérêt. So far, we started with a story where you had to interview your parents, right? How did that work out? He covered so many things that it was hard to ask the second question because okay. he already responded to it. How many of you in the class found that? The subject of your interview was fired up and kind of kept on going. How many of you found it was kind of the opposite, that you had to kind of prompt them and you had to kind of massage the conversation? How did you deal with that, Nikita? I set up tissue boxes for her and I was really scared to interview her because I knew like she had a lot of sad stories and like disappointing uh, about stuff about with her family members because she wasn't spending as much time. The student is always a teacher and a learner. This is a project that where students look at their family's lived experiences as a source of information. And I think it's one of the kind of hidden bits, right? We don't tend to think, you know, we come to school, we learn about what's in books, what's on the internet, what's global, what's current, and uh, what's historic, what's factual. We don't look at our family's lived experience as a source of knowledge. That's one of the things is that it uses what's around us to uncover what is the context of lives at different times and at different places. Go ahead. I never realized he was actually born on the day that it started. And like, that was surprising to Oh, me. so the same day that Bangladesh became a country was the no, day No, like a war. And how did that affect his, his childhood, say? It, it, like, he wasn't open about it. He just told me that. But, okay. And I was trying to like, get in. You know what I see there? I see like a great opportunity for doing additional research, right? About the the historical significance of the war in Bangladesh and, and then maybe that'll help you to understand that a little bit more. Over the years at Glashen, we've been focusing on getting our students to think a little outside the box and a little bit beyond the basics. And we've been using the term deep learning and this is something that took me a little bit to wrap my mind around. I make sure that my students are always thinking a little bit further and a little bit deeper than, than just the surface. It's not enough to just tell the students, this is the formula for your math problem. So Glashen began its deep learning journey uh, about four years ago. We were part of uh, the initiative uh, at the invitation of our school district and Glashen along with five other intermediate schools. And so each school had the opportunity to uh, implement uh, the ideas around deep learning, certainly with support from the school district. It was a learning curve for, for all of us. And in our journey with the New Pedagogies for Deep Learning project, uh, I've seen some different definitions come and go. I've heard definitions that have been developed by our students. But really, for me, an operating definition of, of deep learning is providing really high quality experiences for our students in which they lose both sense of time and space and are so absorbed in the activity or the task that is taking up their entire world. We gave them the framework with the six C's, character education and citizenship and collaboration, communication, uh, creativity and critical thinking. So we gave some tools to uh, focus on that work. So our work is really liberated students to be uh, interested in 
real world problems, not after they graduate, but while they're at school. So uh, deep learning has brought humanity back into learning. I'm going to introduce myself in a language that I was forbidden to learn as a child. I'm an Ojibwe from Northern Ontario, from the North Bay area. So, bonjour, ne boka mahingin ne dejnikos, and nishinabe megizi dodem dokis nenjibo. And I introduced myself in the Ojibwe language. And I use my spirit name because in our community, we're known by our spirit name. We're not known by that name that's given to us by the government. All right, so my spirit name is Wise Wolf. And I'm here today to help tell a story. It's a story about the history of Canada. This is Algonquin territory. It's unsurrendered, unceded territory, which means there's never been negotiations, never been a treaty negotiated between the government and the Algonquian people. And so Ottawa gets, you know, and all of the surrounding cities and, and towns were built on Algonquian territory, but the Algonquian people have never been compensated, never received any kind of money or, or a deal of any type for their land. All of us have found ourselves here from different places. We all share the land now, and this blanket exercise is going to help us understand how we can do that in a good way. Your teacher said that you've been looking at treaties a bit and looking at that nation-to-nation -nation relationship we have. You become part of the story. The blanket exercise is one of the most powerful experiences that we can provide. This particular activity was developed within the Indigenous community of Canada. These blankets represent the northern part of Turtle Island or what we know as Canada, before the arrival of Europeans. You represent the indigenous people. As communities, you often worked together and cooperated with one another. I'll be playing the European colonizer. We'll ask you to stay on the blankets unless we're telling you to leave for different reasons, so. And then when you're asked to leave the blanket, we're gonna ask you to sit in a circle just on the outside again, all right? Scroll number one, please. Respecting yourself is one of the most important things my culture has taught me. Also, the land, water, plants, air, and animals are all very important to our culture and need to be respected. And that was said by Katiri, a Mohawk youth from a community in Quebec. This experience was a really like informative simulation, and it was also nice to hear the quotes from the youth from other Indigenous communities and to hear their voices, and not only the blanket exercise, but the schools that shared history, our Canadian history. The settlers and their leaders recognized you, the First Peoples, as having your own governments, laws, and territories. So one of these ways we recognized your rights was in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, when King George III said the only legal way newcomers could gain control of those lands was by making treaties between the two nations. Our students, through the blanket exercise, are taking on those roles. And so they're seeing history through the lens of an Indigenous person. And the responses of our students as they, they go through that activity and the debriefing that, that follows is always very powerful and always very moving. In some places, Blankets infected with the deadly smallpox virus were given or traded to you, the Indigenous peoples, by settlers with the support of military leaders like Lord Geoffrey Amherst. So I have a blanket that um, represents one of these infected blankets. As a result of this contagious disease that spread across Turtle Island, and we would ask you to step off the blankets. It put me in, like, their like the indigenous people's place just to see what actually happened. One of the most important parts of the blanket exercise, when portions of the blankets that have been folded up, made smaller, start being unfolded. We're gonna head to the south. So when we built Canada, we divided Canada between the United States. So we're gonna make divide it here. And I'm gonna ask two of you to move over to the Canadian side. So when we when we created these borders between Canada and the United States, we divided communities, like the one in Akwesasne. The idea of, uh, of seeing the land, like all of us sharing, standing on the land, on the space, and then having the land take, being taken away from under your feet. Many of these kids experience violence, racism, and abuse, and lost connection to their identity and culture. 
I'm going to ask you to represent one of these children taken from your community during the 60s scoop. So I'll ask you to come with me and take a spot way over here, very far from your community. And that reflects the work that is being done across our country, how our Indigenous people in this country were, were treated. And so by bringing forward the, the blanket exercise and having our students in a very deep learning experience. We always learn from the Europeans' point of view. We always think, yeah, they came for the land. And it, of course, they did some awful things, but it wasn't that bad, right? I was one of the people who got moved from my blanket onto another blanket, and I felt kind of sad that I was being moved from my community. So I felt it was really powerful. As kids, we were taught that we live in the best country in the world. Well. We were never taught, I certainly was never told by my parents, who had never learned that in school, that uh, as people were treated that way. So we, right from the beginning, form a partnership with the school and the system, and we do the practical work of uh, changing how practice happens. We provide, uh, our model requires uh, the school to provide support, so the school principal as a leader, teachers uh, responding, uh, students becoming change agents, and then the system supporting it. So there's a lot of practical work, and I call it practice chasing theory. I think what, what deep learning is really about is just finding different ways to look at a situation. Okay, there's a project. I don't need to just type five pages about it. I can do more research. I can reach out, branch out to other people. And it's much more than um, just what normal schools, it's, it's kind of like a goal that Glashen has. One aspect uh, that we really enjoy, and I would say we really value at Glashen, is the connection that we have to our community. This is a school that has a long history, but it's a school that always has been closely connected to the local neighborhood. And we also sort of build that sense of community by permitting our students to go off of school property to enjoy what is in their community is something that we think in the long run is gonna help those students, uh, first of all, develop a sense of belonging, a sense of trust, and a sense of confidence as they walk and enjoy the streets of their city. I think, you know, it sounds like it's a small thing, but just knowing that the teachers and the principal and the staff members trust us enough to let us go off school property or let us have that student voice and them respecting that student voice, I think that trust and independence really puts responsibility on our shoulders and the students act on that. Thank you. Oh my God. I'm originally from Palestine, but uh, my grandparents and my parents, we, they moved over to Jordan when the war started, and we've been living here for about four years now. I think it's really good of the school that, you know, it welcomes all types of different nationalities and origins and refugees, and I think it's very comforting to know that it's such a diverse community. Glashen has a, a very long history of being a very diverse school. This particular neighborhood in Centertown uh, attracts many people, people who have uh, come to Canada from other countries. And this is reflected in uh, our student population. And questions are often asked, how do we manage that? How do we make our school uh, successful for all of those students, given those diverse backgrounds? And so, you know, within that diversity, uh, we certainly have a lot of students that come to the school with English language needs. English is not their first language. So we've seen in the short span of two years, students who come into our school speaking no English whatsoever, leaving at the grade eight with a very, very strong level of English. And that's something we're really proud of.
最喜欢的课门是地理，因为我可以学到世界上不同的国家。因为我是从中国来的，所以我喜欢知道地理，然后还有国家的历史。Um, either you like geography or you like to put water in cups. I don't know. <laughs> geography. Geography. <laughs> geography. Uh, what were these things? Like it was like a globe and countries. Oh, yeah, I get that. Oh, okay. Why? I'm a decorator. I'm a little nervous. I don't know how to talk about the sea. I'm a little nervous. You said I was nervous. And, Sometimes you get nervous for tests. Well, it was more like at first before doing this, I was nervous. But now that I'm doing this, I mean, I think it's kind of cool. Starbucks and shoppers and spend a lot of money. There's a number of different ways that we can showcase and celebrate the diversity at Glashen. One of the ways that we wanted to try to show that same kind of diversity, in particular the area of language, was to bring a group of students, a small group, and for them to conduct a conversation with each other in their first language. When you have a school like ours, where you have up to 35 different languages spoken, it does provide challenges in terms of ensuring that the language skills in English and French are also developed. And as we went through the circle of friends, the students, I think, really accelerated their own thinking. I think that that uh, helped to grow connections between those students. And I think as a school, it provides us with some potential to build further understanding through language uh, amongst our students. I shop Easter candy So you go to shoppers for candy? Yeah. And that um, now I see a lot of my friends going to shoppers just to buy the Easter candy, just because oh. it's on sale. Oh, yeah. Eu acho muito interessante e eu fiquei um pouco surpresa também quando eu mudei para cá, porque acho que tem, sei lá, quantos canadenses canadenses na minha sala, tipo uns seis, a maioria é tudo estrangeiro. E eu acho isso muito legal, porque cada um tem uma perspectiva por causa do seu passado, então cada um vem a ver as coisas diferentes. Então a gente pode meio saber como as pessoas pensam. It's really great to kind of have this diversity in our school, because it's really amazing to have different perspectives from different people, being globally aware of everything. It's really, like, it's a gift to have, and it's a gift that we can be here and have and share this opportunity and share these different perspectives and thoughts and, um, you know, just to collaborate together. It's, it's amazing. So right now we're going to get into groups, and we're going to play a game called Mingle. Have you guys heard of that? Sort of? OK, let me explain. When Hala says go, we're all going to stand up again, we're going to walk around, and when Hala says stop, we're going to get into groups of five and try to be with people you don't know. That sound good? Okay. Go. So here at Glossian, we have a very interesting and what I think is a very unique and one-of-a-kind deep learning team. I think there's about maybe 30 to 40 students on the team this year. Uh, between grade seven and eight. We try our absolute best to be ambassadors, I guess. Um, we try to be representatives um, for each class, and we try to figure out ways we consult, we talk to Mr. Taylor and the rest of the staff here at Glossian about how we can really get the ideas flowing and get the whole concept of deep learning into our classrooms. For me, I feel successful when I've learned new things that I can translate into life application. So I, I feel well, most successful when I learn things that I'm going to use on a day-to-day -day basis. Three of you as members of our deep learning team have seen the growth and seen the, the results of our efforts. Sort of the, the dream was to pull the adults back from this process, right? Because in terms of deep learning, it really is about your understanding yourselves as, as learners. Yeah. It's really important that our students, as teachers and as learners, have the chance to be able to go through a process where they learn more about themselves yeah. as learners. Yeah. I'd ask you if you'd be interested in working with me to, to go through through a process similar to what you went through, what I facilitated, but now with you facilitating yeah. with right. a group of grade sevens. Okay, yeah. you're, you're game yeah. for that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Coming into it throughout the years, I think student voice has increased a lot in the deep learning team, and I think students are taking initiative in things like recruiting the grade sevens to come and join and brainstorming ideas and everything. I think, for me, one of the most authentic things about the deep learning team and 
What makes it so special is the student voice. Guys, you guys heard of the sandbox before? Uh, yes, we have. All right, well, you probably know, or I could tell it to you, it's an augmented reality like learning tool. It's really made for deep learning. And it's basically like what you can do is like simulate water and create landscapes with it. See, as the contour lines, the lower and higher you go, it'll stay in a barrier there until you would build something like that, which then it would flow downwards. There's different ways you can use this. Uh, you guys, like I have a few, like you can do flood prevention and like uh, landscape shaping. There's a few different modes on this, so it's not just water. You can actually have lava. Yes. Burn everything. And ice. Oh, cool. So you just stick your hand above, like about a couple centimeters, and then open your like palm like that. Whoa! Burn it all. You can like shape different shapes. Like you can go ahead and make like a flat oh, landscape or an oh, island oh, or. Look, it's all like nothing. I use deep learning every day, like all the people in our school or the people in the deep learning team. I like look at different ways to solve new problems, always using technology to incorporate my work. That technology is rapidly developing, and there's always different learning styles, and there's different ways to learn. The sandbox is, well, the Xbox is mounted, and it projects the light. And because of the elevation, if you put your hand in certain places, the water will flow down as if, if, if it were a real 3D map. And I think it's helpful for kinesthetic learners or maybe making geography a little more interesting. It would also be helpful for maybe reenacting history scenes and seeing how the geography affected what happened. So what if, what if you showed us an example if it did rain? So if it did rain up here, most of it just flows right off and it doesn't yeah. affect the city at yeah. all. If we had a flood, it's still, yeah, it still looks like it won't affect the top of this mountain very much. It'll just affect everything below yeah. it. Yeah, it just all flows down. How can we use the sandbox effectively as a teaching tool? And at that point, I said, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if we talk to the students and ask them what they think we could do with this? I like to get my students involved in planning the actual project instead of me just telling them, this is your, this is your assignment, giving them that opportunity to say, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we could do it this way? Do you think it would be better used as, like, I come up with project and you carry out project? or we design something together in, to do with this? I think a more creative design process, like we yeah. come up with a project or a guideline even, yeah. and then put us hands on with it and create it ourselves. When we introduced the deep learning project at Glashan, the change process for teachers, and really for all of us, can be, can be threatening, and it can be a little bit scary. And it can make you question your professionalism or your ability to be an effective educator. So what we were able to do was in small steps to help staff feel comfortable through uh, small team meetings. So we actually developed uh, what we call the 100-minute meeting. And that's a meeting where teachers um, will join together for 100 minutes and discuss ways that they could look at uh, units of study that they've already created. I'm not sure that having a whole class in here at once would be um, the most beneficial. So what do you think we could do yeah, instead? Like, do you have any uh, ideas? Yeah, maybe small groups mm -hmm. of four, three yeah. or four. Yeah, because this right here is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe us or mm -hmm. maybe one more person. So setting up collaborative teams where yeah. teams of students work together? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, of course. Glashen, we are a very busy school and there are field trips going on all the time. Part of what makes Glashen very unique is the ability to walk to different locations. So we're very close to many museums. So we can go to the War Museum, we can go to the History Museum, we can go to the Museum of Nature. We also take our students to go on ski trips. There's local ski hills that we can go to. We also have the Rideau Canal, which we spend time skating on in the winter.
chance to speak with your teacher. I've heard about what you've studied and some of the traditions that you have, like the blankets, the blanket exercise. You're going to find this a fascinating tour today. Hopefully you learned something that you didn't know before you came today and that it helps sort of, um, I don't know, that it sort of immerses you in the First Peoples culture, which is a really rich culture. It's a fascinating story and it's a story that continues to be told, right? The story is not over, so, all right. This for us is our symbolic village. We call it symbolic because in reality, 12 to 15,000 years ago, you never would have seen six different nations side by side like this. They did not all get along like they were best friends. However, this is a great way for the museum to be able to show you six different styles of architecture. We're in the Museum of History. We learned about indigenous peoples in Canada and what their lifestyle was like. And it was very eye-opening for me just to see like the way it, they transformed to now. This is called the Spirit of Haidagwai. It was made by a famous artist by the name of Monsieur Bill Reed. So Bill Reed is um, from the Haida First Nations, but he's got also some European background. And this is a gorgeous sculpture telling us about how indigenous people see the world. That's good. It's really a pleasure. Like I, I'm really proud that I can like miss school and like and go to these beautiful trips and learn about our country's beautiful like history and everything about our country. Essentially what we're trying to do is have the students engaged on a level that makes them responsible for their own learning and that in turn makes them excited and, and willing to be here and to experience new challenges and persevere. So one really good thing about Glashen and its administration is that if there's something that we want to do, we get support for it. So last year, another teacher, Renee Blay and myself, we'd never done an exchange program. And there is one that's um, called Experiences Canada, and we were accepted. So we went to uh, Terrace, BC, which is in northern BC, and uh, with 50 grade seven students, and it's funded pretty much by by, uh, the federal government pays the organization who pay for our flights and we stayed in homes in uh, that community and then about three months later 60 of kids from that school came to Ottawa and stayed in the homes of our students. We were supported by our administration to try that experience out. We see that through the curriculum of history, history and geography, but rather history in this 7th and 8th, it gives them a taste of the past and it gives them really des, des connections real qui ne sont pas trouvés dans un livre, mais qui sont vraiment là devant leurs yeux et puissent toucher, goûter, entendre, vraiment avoir une expérience excellente d'immersion. En huitième année, pour les quelques années passées, on a offert un voyage outre-mer. Alors nous sommes allés en Chine deux fois et en Suède une fois. Les enfants se, se présentent comme candidats. Euh, le processus de sélection, c'est assez rigoureux et on, on a choisi les trois années euh, dernières. On a choisi 12 élèves pour partir en voyage afin de comprendre un petit peu plus comment ça fonctionne à travers le monde. So this 10 day trip to China was like the best trip ever. It was like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So we first got to go to Beijing, go to the Great Wall of China. Then we went to Suqian and we got to meet our homestays for the first time. How is everyone today? Good. Doing good? That's good to hear. So yeah, this is a sort of like a virtual reality project. The goal of the project was to sort of emulate uh, visiting different spots in Beijing. Uh, so we have three main sort of uh, tourist areas. There's the Temple of Heaven, uh, there's the Forbidden City, and there's the Great Wall of China. So you'll be checking out uh, three different spots today. 
to get an experience of uh, the sort of scale of the structures and what, and what it would be like to actually be there. Okay, so you can put that on. You can let me know how it feels. I think it really ties in with using digital tools to enhance our learning. It really helps us to kind of learn on a different perspective, learn from a different view compared to when we just had, say, a notebook and a textbook and the teacher would be giving a lecture or something like that. Creating an overall environment that is really powerful for students to develop academic skills, social skills, emotional skills, all within the context of a positive learning environment in a classroom. The DL5 is a, a Galashian creation. The five most important components, which we named the DL5 or, or Deep Learning 5, this is a student role. So, for example, uh, it is really important for the students at our school to know and understand the six C's. It's also very important for our students to demonstrate uh, a growth mindset. We also want our students to know that everyone is both a teacher and a learner. I would say that um, good teaching has always done some of this, right? Strengthen your growth mindset, um, understand yourself as a learner. So that's something I think that good teachers have always tried to do. So what the DL5 does is it kind of packages it and adds another dimension. So for sure, in the last uh, five, 10 years, uh, the use of digital tools has really added to the educational endeavor. But d having a digital tool is not the only piece. It's like what you do with it and how you use it to connect you to the wider world and connect the kids, the kids too, to the wider world world and the world back to them and I, I really love the aspect of strength in your growth mindset I think that is allows for mistakes and it helps us to build resilience with kids so when kids are unfamiliar or uncomfortable or they're trying something new we can say to them look we're all strengthening our growth mindset here find a different seat than your own and then your own table. So self-assessment is a really key part and often uh, in my assignments before I assess it I will we'll do a walkabout actually so that they'll see multiple examples of that same task, multiple ways of expressing that, that those ideas and then they'll assess themselves according to whatever the, the rubric is or the criteria and then when I do my assessment they can see do they understand uh, where they're at in terms of the standards, say, the general standards? Um, so that's one way that self-assessment works, but it also works whenever you ask them to reflect on their own learning. Try to, uh, to finish up um, the one that you're reading and then go back to your desk and read what other people said about your draft. Pendant l'évaluation des élèves pour leurs travaux, alors c'est un processus qui, qui suit vraiment dès le départ d'une activité jusqu'à la fin. Très souvent les élèves et moi on va créer ensemble les grilles d'évaluation, alors à bien répondre aux normes, aux critères, ça, ça, ça tomberait sous un, un certain niveau de rendement. Alors les élèves sont, sont vraiment conscients dès le début d'où est-ce qu'ils doivent aller dans leurs travaux et comment ils peuvent approfondir, comment ils peuvent euh, passer euh, encore plus loin que, euh, que les besoins de base. Alors les élèves qui comprennent vraiment bien leur tâche vont être capables non seulement d'aller plus loin indépendamment, mais ils peuvent soutenir leur père. Ils agissent comme une ressource vraiment euh, coopérative. We have 
incredible sport staff and facilities and teams here, like the provincial champions. Everybody's encouraged to participate, like all the girls, and it really encourages us to play and to try. There's many people who are last year on the recreational and now they're the best on the teams. And you know, it really like encourages the healthy living and active living and it makes us better people. How many times have you used them? Um, like four. Four times? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How do they feel? They feel good. Okay. Good. Line and lift up. One, two, three. Oh, good. All right, my grade sevens. Something that you don't know about me, and there's lots you don't know about me, but I'm a skating instructor. I work at hockey schools, well, I used to work at hockey schools, and I work, used to work with hockey teams. So I was what was called a power skating instructor. So I know how to teach kids how to skate. What you're gonna have is a Glashan skating lesson from me. Here we go, make sure everything's good. All right, come on, come on. We know that the best learning takes place outside of your comfort zone. So let's see what we can do about helping you become even better skaters. Three, two, one. that not every student is going to be as successful if they are trapped in a desk for five periods a day doing work that really isn't uh, all that relevant to them. This is a changed school. This is not the Glashan of five years ago. We have moved forward in substantial ways in those key areas uh, of the deep learning project, our learning partnerships, our learning environment, our pedagogical practices, and certainly in the way that we leverage digital as a school. So there's a place for everyone in a deep learning school. We have a responsibility to educate our boys and our girls in terms of what does it mean to be a responsible person? What does it mean to have healthy relationships? This is a societal issue. There's a call of urgency that we feel as a school we needed to respond to by doing what we felt was appropriate to help change the status quo. Glorious and free, O oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee. O oh, Canada, we stand on God for thee.
uma parceria SESI, uma iniciativa da CNI, Confederação Nacional da Indústria. <música>